Hi everybody, thanks so much to join us. I'm Domenico Fabio Masi, Marketing Manager for Teletemia. Today we are presenting firmware management. This webinar provides you a complete tour of the OTA methods available to address cellular, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi communication module with OTA firmware update. I would like to introduce today the presenter, Vika Saota, our regional technical sales manager for Telit UK and Nordics. And uh, a recorded version of this webinar will be available. And uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please type them into the question box in your control panel. In any case, we have time uh, at the end of the webinar for any question. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy our webinar and Vikas, feel free to start. Excellent, thank you, Dominic. Okay, so today's uh, agenda is going to talk about quite an important topic, firmware over the air. So this is something that's become uh, increasingly important over the years for customers to be able to maintain the latest firmware version, to keep up with new standards and new features which are being developed and also changes within the network which can mean that firmware needs to change. So the agenda we're going to follow today is having a look at the firmware over the air techniques for the cellular modems, 2G, 3G, 4G. There's a couple of systems, or actually several systems by the time we're, we're done in order to allow this. We have a kind of legacy photo which we developed on the 2G, 3G devices. Uh, later we move towards uh, more standards and we have um, SWM based on the OMA DM. Um, the AT photo is something that highlights uh, maybe a more flexible way for some customers to use over-the-air upgrades when perhaps their network doesn't allow access via incoming SMS or to reach um, via IP to an external server. So in, sometimes you need a little bit more flexibility and the AT methods can allow you to have that. Uh, the latest uh, developments really on this go towards device management and also firmware over the air as part of a device management. And this uh, really leads into the future and uh, lightweight M2M -M protocol. So we'll spend also a couple of slides just to, just to recap on that and see how it fits, in, fits into this picture. Firmware over the air is also interesting. Uh, we could spend, spend our time talking about cellular, but of course we do have uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi modules. And so the over the air topics also are relevant to these. Uh, perhaps maybe in a slightly different way, we'll have a look at this as well and the techniques you use to, to deploy firmware into these kind of devices. So it should be a nice round trip covering over the air upgrades across uh, as much of the product range as we can. Okay, so a brief introduction, uh, and this is for the cellular over the air system. Okay, so the main point is really implementing the putting the right tools for the software management throughout the life cycle. This has actually become a thing. So in the olden days, people used to throw the, the kit out there. I still remember maybe 15 years ago talking to customers who are used to dealing with uh, microprocessors and maybe even, uh, you know, ROM one-time programmable microprocessors. And if you would say to them, hey, that's great customer, can you please leave the ability to be able to upgrade the modem firmware? You would get a rather funny look as they would wonder if there's something actually wrong with your device, which is why we might need them to upgrade in future. So there was a kind of ethos which meant, you know, if it worked, don't touch it. If it worked, it will continue to work and there's no reason for it not to continue to work. And of course, this is a uh, completely uh, risky risky kind of a strategy to work with. There's far too many variables in the various networks, in the features, in the new technologies being deployed, and we're, we're kind of on the bleeding edge, especially with the new technologies. So new, new scenarios can arise. You know, you end up with, uh, let's say, networks merging. This has never happened, uh, you know, globally, but when two networks decide to do it, it can create issues. If we're able to address firmware in the field, we may be able to stop um, the worst case situation of some units uh, you know, becoming out of service and unable to communicate. On the other side, rather than network changes, there may be new features. So 
uh, example in case could be uh, TLS. So this is a security technology which has moved in standards. Now on older firmware, we support the older standards which was relevant at that time. And on the newer firmware, we support the newer security standards. Um, and at some point, these security standards are also becoming uh, expired. So unless the customer is willing to move forward in their firmware, they may find that although it's not a, um, an issue with the modem, it's not a network issue, but there may be some new feature which either they need to uh, use or perhaps it would give them some great advantage. One example could be the lightweight M2M. So if the customer is using uh, our cloud connectivity, it could be possible for them to use the new features in the new uh, firmware to use, um, let's say, 70% less data during um, typical communications with the cloud. Again, it's a benefit which is tangible and it would require you to move firmware. So the best thing we can do is leave this door open. So we've designed several ways to do this. The legacy photo system that's been widely used in you know, devices and, and it still exists today. You can do AT photo even on the ME910, the category M1. Um, from the initial offering, we, we then developed uh, what we called SWM FUMO and the SWM server. Um, and this really eliminated uh, you know, the need for the guys to redevelop um, custom software in order to manage over the air upgrades. And it gave a kind of off the shelf uh, solution for the customer to be able to run a campaign. And then finally, we'll have a look at Lightweight M2M. And this is uh, really the next generation. This is where the device management this topic becomes integrated within the, the Tele-IoT portal. We have uh, active clients on the device and on the portal side which can enable this to happen and happen in a very uh, cost and uh, efficient way, cost efficient, energy efficient way. Okay, so this will cover the, the cellular story. So legacy OTA methods for telet modems. Now these are the, the different ways in which we can push firmware down onto the device itself. Uh, going from the top, um, you can see in the first example, we have uh, a microprocessor in the middle there. It's either, let's say, this could be your host PC. If you're connecting directly to the evaluation kit, you'll be connecting your host PC or MCU directly via UART or USB to the telet module. And this is the normal method of, uh, of working. You would then download the full binary. So on your PC, this is going from your web browser. You download from the download zone the new firmware. And then you would use XFP tool, or if you're using Linux, LXFP. And if you've got a host microprocessor, you can also have access from us to the XFP protocol. And all this is is a very simple uh, protocol which works over the UART or USB and it pushes or injects the firmware into the modem. This is a standard case. There's nothing really special about it. The binary which is being delivered is a full-size binary. Um, this is how you may do it in system. Now, there's a couple of complications because a host PC needs to be able to control uh, a couple of aspects of the modem. It needs to be able to synchronize when that modem turns on because there's a bootloader it will need to attach to. So you need control of the on-off line in order to run it. Also, something that sometimes stalls customers is that there is uh, really you need to be able to have your MCU stable at 115-200 baud rate. Um, the default for XFP is to begin the process at 115-200 and then usually after some blocks if you've requested a speed change that speed change can go up or down. However, the process always starts at 115-200. And in some cases, we've had customers who, who have MCUs capable of only, only a lower speed. And in this case, we, we rarely see success. Also, we've had customers uh, trying to build in some uh, sort of pass-through uh, pass through interface. So they can use XFP, which is then going to pass through their microprocessor and into the module. This is also doomed to failure. Um, I've probably seen it work once um, in my time. Um, just the timing around this is, is, is not good. 
So that's best of best avoided. So in the top section then, the standard way uh, via Windows XFP tool, via Linux LX, LXFP, or via your host process so we can embed the protocol there. Um, the second method uh, really is a little bit more special. So what happens is the, the host microprocessor is not actually involved in, in the data path here. It doesn't need to collect directly the binary file. Instead, the binary file is going to be collected by the modem uh, and directly it can be managed via a push or a pull and the customer can manage this or tell it can manage the campaign. Anyway, once the, the device is either receiving a signal and acknowledging it to the modem, the modem basically then goes to an FTP server and collects the new firmware. Once this is uh, received, the microprocessor gets a message and he can then request the modem to unpack this firmware. So resolve the Delta file uh, into a full firmware and basically update the modem. The important point here is the, the file which is arriving is actually a Delta file rather than the full binary. So for reference, let's say with a, a 3G modem, uh, or a 2G modem, let's say. A 2G modem, we can have a, a, a 3 meg binary file. That could be the original binary file. <coughs> now, depending on um, the delta, um, uh, the delta file, let's say, typically could be, it could be under 100 kilobytes, it could be between 100 and 200 kilobytes, significantly smaller than the full size 3 meg uh, binary. And the difference, as the name suggests, it's a delta file. So if we have, it's moving between firmware A and firmware B. And if we have a large number of changes in between these two firmwares, the Delta file becomes bigger. And if it's a small patch fix, the Delta file becomes very small. Okay, so there's a function of that, but regardless, the Delta file is incredibly small compared to the full size binary. Uh, therefore, the cost of delivering it down to the device when you are doing this in the field is much less. The microprocessor is always in control. He's able to drive uh, this feature and also he's able to deny the feature. Um, so of course, nothing ever happens from Telet. We don't push firmware to devices. It's all triggered by the customer. So customer needs to check the new firmware with their host application, make sure this is a, a good combination. Otherwise, they'll need to make sure that their first, that their host application can cope with the old Telet firmware and with the new Telet firmware. So this all needs to be tested on the bench to make sure it works before any deployment happens. And then the deployment happens at the customer's request. The example at the bottom um, opens up a little bit more flexibility. So in the second example, in the center, we saw that the, the Delta file is being pulled from a, a Telet server. Also, when we're managing this in a push mode, uh, the Telet module is, um, let's see, when we're managing this, yeah, in a push mode, the Telet, the telet module is actually sending a message back to the, the microprocessor to, to let it know what to happen. In the end, that message is coming via SMS. So there's an SMS photo push down to the device, which is signaling the start of the update. Now, in some cases with some customers, let's say incoming SMS may not be an option. So the SIM cards you're using may not have associated the services for SMS, in which case it becomes difficult for us to reach you in these means. So customers can decide and you know, this has happened in the past, they need more flexibility. So rather than tell it running a campaign, they would like to run the campaign and they would like to add eight methods uh, and control this process completely via AT commands. So in this method, you could download the Delta file. Let's say if you have a, a router system and you have also LAN and Wi-Fi, you may be able to download the Delta file over the Wi-Fi into your host microprocessor and then you may be able to pass the Delta file into the module over the UART and then ask again the module to unpack the Delta file into the full image. So you can see there's several ways that have been developed in order to have the flexibility to work with customers 
um, regardless of which kind of sims they use or which kind of connectivity. The only difference is uh, who is running the campaign and how much work and integration does it involve. So in this in the center option, the customer doesn't need to do much. The teller is running the service and they will push or we will push the firmware down to the device. On the lower side of this, the customer ends up running the campaign. Now that may be beneficial and they may like the idea of being in, able to integrate firmware version control into their back-end system. And uh, this will take us forward as you'll see towards uh, Lightweight M2M. Okay, next slide. Oh, right. So the legacy photo service, this was our first implementation. It was uh, really an internal service. Um, it was not accessible to the customer and it was going to allow uh, campaigns to run. So we had a server, or we have a server running inside. There's four SMS uh, service centers, I think, at least connected to this. So it's got redundancy. So it's able to send these SMS. It's uh, running over a TCP IP protocol. Um, yes, and it can manage the campaign. So some devices will pass, some will fail during the first operation. The campaign server is able to, to retry upgrades. And, uh, and basically pull out a report so the customer will in the end have a report on which devices have succeeded on this upgrade campaign and which have failed. The key points, uh, this was based uh, with uh, Red Bend's uh, Delta technology. So Red Bend's uh, not a household name as such, but it's uh, still fa fairly famous in the background because they do run um the updates behind you know millions of handsets around the world so we haven't you know made something proprietary in this sense we've we've used a standard off the shelf uh, well you know, industry leading let's say component in order to deliver that so pretty bulletproof um the capabilities uh, only to update the modem firmware itself so we can't address any external applications or anything like this. It's dedicated to the modem firmware. The nice benefit of using uh, the Red Bend Delta technology and putting a client inside the module is that we don't require any real extra resources from the host application. So there's no need for you to add extra memory or have a, a microprocessor with a, with a certain amount of resource free in order to support this. Really, all we're talking about is implementing um, the ability to understand and react to a few more AT commands. So it's entirely AT based. The host micro need never be in the data path. Now, the client we have for this uh, photo system uh, is already embedded into basically all the devices we have in the field for as long as you can remember. So even if we trace back to the old uh, G864s, yes, they support photo even in the field today. Um, and we can have flexible methods as we'll see with the uh, AT photo to, to manage triggering and transferring the Delta file. So exactly as I was mentioning, we need a little bit more flexibility in some cases on how this update is triggered and where the Delta is stored exactly. So legacy photo, um, it was a completely proprietary client based on TCP based protocols. Um, and in these days, there wasn't a standard protocol really, so this is quite sufficient. Um, SMS and IP-based uh, photo pop and push. So as I mentioned, we're using SMS to, to, to push messages and IP where it's available and devices are online. Um, our normal campaign was initiated by the server side. So the customer would request the upgrade, provide us with the full information, and then we would be able to initiate the, the campaign from the server side. Now, there's a couple of requirements for this to work out. One of these I've mentioned is the ability and the details to be able to SMS the devices in the field. If we can't SMS the devices in the field, it's difficult for us to reach them and they're not going to get the upgrade message. And also, it requires the device to be able to reach back to Telet server in order to download the Delta file. Now, in some more strict 
cases, let's say where the customer has a private APN, they have a VPN connecting into their system, in effect what they're building is a very secure route and perhaps they have data, perhaps it's medical data, they don't want um, data to be traversing over the, the open internet yeah, because they're, they're living at the moment, their data is only flowing in a, in a, in a security pipe, let's say. In this case, uh, we have some flexibility uh, via the AT photo to try and deploy the firmware file directly within their IT infrastructure. So we mentioned that there was a, a server running um, and this was dealing with the campaign update. This is how it would work in practice. Um, so you have Tele on the right and the customer on the left. Uh, the customer would open a, a tech support case with Tele uh, to request the upgrade, we would check on the feasibility, the module type, um, and make sure that we can do this operation. Um, if the operation was going to be billable to the customer, then this would be generating a quote. The customer, once they agree to proceed, and the, they've soaked tested in their premises the new versions against the old, uh, they would provide us with the, the list of the modules, the MSISDN list, and then we would be able to run the campaign on the customer's behalf on our own proprietary server. In the end, the, the customer would receive a, a success rate report. So they would know which devices have passed and which have failed. Uh, there would be multiple retries involved in this campaign. And this was the customer experience. It left some room because um, it was completely offloaded. You know, going from here, uh, the customer was over the years becoming more interested in being able to also manage the campaign. So the next generation of what we delivered, and this appeared around with the 3G modems, also with the 4G modems, uh, was based around some standards developing. So specifically from the uh, OMA DM protocol standards. There were a few standards developed at that time. We had uh, talk of uh, FUMO, which is allowing the firmware on the module to be updated. But there were also a couple of uh, other methods called SCOMO and LOMO, which would be able to touch down to the application firmware rather than the module firmware. In the end, this hasn't really been uh, developed further, but the FUMO does exist. So just the ability to uh, device manage. OMADM, by the way, is for device management protocol. Um, again, you leverage the, the Red Bend um, Delta engine in order to have the efficient delta, si uh, delta size and also the same kind of client which can unpack the delta on the module. So again, this delta technology is going to compare to two different versions and generate the delta file as the delta between the versions. So we need to know which firmware a customer is currently running and which firmware they need to move to. And then based on this information, we generate the delta in between these firmware images. The Red Bend engine really is very efficient in this, is, uh, really is going to guarantee the smallest and most efficient del delta file sizes. At the back end, we also employed uh, the Red Bend SWM Center. Now, this uh, is a piece of software or, or a platform as a service which serves uh, millions of devices already around the world. So, again, it's a kind of a rock solid component which we've employed here. Um, it's totally hosted, it doesn't require any IT integration from the customer. And in the end, what the customer has is a web front end. So you will be able to log into this and manage and run the update campaigns by yourself. So here the customer is now put in control with a web interface allowing them rather than us to run the campaign. And also this is no longer a proprietary but are based on, the, well, it's based on the Red Bend technology as a standard within, within the industry at least. <coughs> The other thing we were able to do is also integrate something we call the Telic Protocol Adapter, and that provided um, comms and interoperability with the previous legacy photo. So where we spoke about the photo pop and push protocol, uh, we were able to also embed this um, into the SWM system to have compatibility uh, with older and newer devices. 
So the customer experience in this case has changed. So the devices that are able to use the SWM server, this is still running. We have a login. You can uh, get onto the control panel um, and fire the system up. You can test it for yourselves if you'd like. Um, in this case, yeah, the experience has changed. The customer, um, basically, we, we go, let's start on top. Number one, we provision the module. So the module needs to be provisioned into the OTA system. The components and the devices. Once we feed this into the software management center and all the information exists for the delta to happen, the customer can basically select this delta, select their estate of devices and define the campaign uh, by themselves. They can set up the campaign execution and they can view how this uh, campaign is uh, progressing, the status, individual devices, and of course they can generate a report based on how this campaign is running. So very similar to the legacy version, except that it's using a, a server and a service which has been externalized and the customer is now put directly in control of this. So this is the uh, SWM service. Just an idea of some of uh, the main blocks that go into that. We have the SWM center itself, um, supporting a couple of protocols, the Telet protocol adapter, which is dealing with the very legacy, um, the earliest photo system we have. And then we have on the lower side, uh, OMA-DM, FUMO, SCOMO. So the new generation we, we deployed within 3G and 4G devices. In either case, you've got the VRapid mobile and VDirect mobile, which is, um, part of the Red Bend uh, Delta engine. And these clients are deployed onto the device side. And also these client, well, same system is used uh, on the left-hand side in order to generate the update images. The service architecture, uh, yeah, this gets a little bit complex. We can probably skip over this today, actually. Uh, come back to me if you've got questions on that one. Um, I think the SWM we've covered as well, and it's time to talk about AT Photo. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, these kind of two systems, having the legacy standard we run the campaigns or having uh, the SWM server, these kind of walked in the right direction. Um, but at where we are today, we've really led into device management and customers' back-end systems becoming more tightly integrated with features that can manage the device. So on the road to this, of course, we had a lot of requests. Once we had the legacy um, photo, we had the SWM photo, um, customers would then come to us and say, okay, well, the SMS is, uh, we, can't, we can't use the SMS, we need to find another way. Or the IP and where the, where the data is stored, where the Delta file is stored, this may not be accessible, we need to do this in a different direction. So some flexibility was developed. So if they do, you know, by the nature of the connectivity, the security, the architecture, if they cannot use the standard methods, it, they may prefer to go and <clears throat> integrate more deeply. And we can do this with the AT commands. This means they also need to be willing to manage the campaign because we're going to hand them some AT commands to derive this process. However, signaling uh, the need to update down to the device, uh, retrying if there are failures, this is all part of the campaign. And now the customer needs to manage this rather than our system. So in the end, the AT photo commands are going to allow to, to engage these Delta files a little bit more freely, um, where you can have this kind of flexibility. Um, how does this work? Well, the host application uh, triggers and controls the whole process via AT commands. The Delta file is going to be hosted, and this can be hosted on our, on our servers, or it can be hosted with the customer somewhere on an FTP server within the network. So they need to place the Delta file there. The host application is then going to send some AT commands to the modem, which is a signal to go and collect the Delta file. A further signal, once this has been received successfully, will allow the module to unpack this Delta file and perform the upgrade. Now, the whole process is being monitored over the AT port, and there is a fail-safe implementation. So for some reason, if the new Delta file is uh, having a problem while it's being unpacked, 
then actually there's enough space on the device to completely unpack uh, the new firmware using the delta or generate the new firmware via the old firmware using the delta and then switch over. So at no point do, do we delete the active firmware until the new firmware has been verified and if it cannot be verified then we basically fall back to the older firmware and continue working from there report a failure to the system and to your host and so you can retry um, yeah this is a pretty bulletproof implementation clearly we can't have this fail in the field so this has been tested to death as you can imagine another option can be rather than to ask the modem to download directly the delta file into its own memory if it's preferred then the delta file can be downloaded by the host application itself so there may be some memory or storage attached to the host application. Perhaps it's a larger embedded Linux-based system or something like this. Um, and perhaps this Delta file can arrive through a non-billable route, such as LAN or, or Wi-Fi. In which case, the preference would be to, to, to bring over LAN or Wi-Fi, the Delta file, into the device. It could be also over cellular. There's nothing to, to really stop this. In any case, once the Delta file is um, contained by the host, this can be then injected back into the module. So between these few different methods of working, really this opens up the flexibility um, for customers to, to, to embed the campaign also into their protocol. So they are already using some protocol in order to, to share application data or do some basic device management with the device and this would allow them to also embed firmware over the air into that kind of system. So several customers, yeah, over the over the years have gone down this route also. Usually if people are preparing ahead of time they will consider this and usually if they you know, come to learn about photo only after they have a problem of some kind then it's often the, the, the managed services that we deploy with. So where do we go from here? Um, all these methods exist on devices out there. You can already uh, go and test them today and in, in cases we use these to support customers, of course. Um, in the future, you know, we're looking towards lightweight M2M. So we've selected this as a, you know, the next generation protocol really, which is going to meet quite a lot of needs and do so in an efficient and attractive way. Um, all of this development with um, <clears throat> with the um, IoT portal, uh, the Internet of Things, and uh, increasing awareness, new technologies being developed has really led people to, towards understanding that device management and managing the life cycle of these devices in the field is 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 an important point. So there becomes a need for our hardware modules, both the cellular, short range devices, really any communications module in the end, to have a device management solution. And something, if we can offer it, it's going to integrate very well with our IoT portal. So we're going to support lightweight M2M. This is something uh, ongoing and uh, being deployed at the moment and part, you know, active actually. Um, and this can this can basically satisfy end customers and operators. Why? Because end customers need device management, and they would like to integrate these kind of device management features into their into their systems. And also, operators also demanding lightweight M2M as a prerequisite in order to have certification. So, particularly if we look to the North America. Uh, AT&T and Verizon, and especially on the latest technologies with the category M1, uh, lightweight M2M is a protocol which is, uh, you know, part of part of this is focused on device management really. So this can address um, provisioning, lifecycle management, and also over the air upgrading. It's a very good fit for our objectives, um, and 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 we're pretty much behind this. It's going to be a good solution. Um, it's part of a, a greater initiative we have called the uh, IoT Module 2.0, which is basically to provide as many services and features available out of the box, and that can be engaged particularly against our IoT portal. The benefits of uh, Lightweight M2M, 
so this is a protocol and the main benefit is really it's a very very low bandwidth by design so it's using more of a, a binary system uh, a co-op protocol and also uh, dtls so a fairly lightweight security protocol um, mqtt and json strings as you know, the current standard is is in fact um, uh, has a lot of overhead around the actual data that you're transferring so it's a very verbose method there's big json strings and a lot of formatting that's not needed and and really a kind of low level engineer would probably pack the same information into about 10 bytes <laughs> and be done whereas uh, with mqtt there is a lot of overhead so lightweight m2m is really going back towards having a more of a binary approach and the way you do that is by defining uh lots of different binary messages and that's that's exactly what occurs here um some of these messages are designated for uh, device management and the system can also be extended to cope with uh, objects which the customer wants to develop so objects which reflect their application so commercial reasons mnos they're going to require it because module vendors well well, they're going to require it from module vendors in the future so device management as we said it's becoming important and the network uh, is requesting the ability to device manage to some extent it's also uh, as we see superior to the other communication protocols which have been in use today notably tr50 uh, mqtt with that um, tr69 omadm uh, which we spoke about in the previous slides and the range of proprietary protocols which have been used for device management so we're going to a, a world where we have a, a nice efficient binary based uh, well-defined standard for device management rather than a, a collection of various protocols none of which is uh, particularly efficient so how does it compare um, OMADM was the old standard and you can see the, the transports used uh, lightweight M2M in comparison is using uh, CoAP over UDP. So we don't need a TCP session engaged uh, because this also has overhead. Uh, SMS is still used to signal. Um, the data model is expandable and it's kept simple so the customer can understand this and extend it rather than the OMADM which uh, was difficult. The message overhead you can see is clearly the lowest uh, compared to uh, TR50, MDM, lightweight M2M, tens of bytes of overhead rather than hundreds or thousands. Of course, it allows for the device management, this we know, the application management, which is very interesting. So not only the device management, but this is extensible across the application as well to reflect key information for example a thermometer reading or a humidity sensor this data can be passed over lightweight m2m not only the device management and in that one thing it's distinguished itself certainly from OMADM and tr69 already further um, it's applicable um, to even more iot constrained devices so a perfect fit for category m1 for category uh, nb1 and so forth and the client size is also particularly small so this means we can scale the solution also on to the higher end modules and down to the lower end modules which is perfect so the next generation of lightweight iot protocol what does it do it gives us a 70 percent reduction in the data usage when we compare it to something like mqtt and json 70% is a big big number, so this is clearly uh, going to uh, prick up the ears for the customers. What else goes alongside that? Well, of course, if you're moving less data, you're going to be consuming less power. Your battery life is going to be lasting longer. You'll be generating less heat, so on and so forth. A load of extra benefits. There's a flexibility in the system, so device management objects, you can really have uh, advanced management and have minimal overhead implementing this. It's also secure because we're using the DTLS uh, 1.2 protocols and it's able to support user-defined objects. So as we said, the customer can extend this in order to uh, really cater for the messages and the, the type of device he's dealing with in his specific application. And now we have a built-in integration into uh, Telit's portal. 
So all aspects of this lightweight M2M is uh, deployed into Telex IoT portal and implemented. So you can access things like, uh, as usual within our system, set up triggers, campaigns, and connections, all managed using the lightweight M2M protocol running in the background rather than the MQTT. The client we have running, it's a lightweight M2M specification from the AMA. Um, it is um, operating system and hardware architecture agnostic, which means uh, we don't need to limit this to one device or it's not gonna be very you know, difficult for us to port in future onto different devices. It's running single threaded. So this in itself is, is great. We don't have a lot of requirements for a multi-threaded uh, system. So we can basically have a compliance with all, with all our devices. Uh, POSIX and non-POSIX implementations. Again, this helps towards having compliance on all of our devices. Um, it can support Windows, uh, yeah, Ubuntu, different versions. Nice thing is it's agnostic to the actual transport layer. So we're supporting UDP. Uh, there's no need for a connection there. SMS, uh, DTLS, uh, also requirements from MNOs in some countries. And it's also Delta agent agnostic. So it can be decoupled now from the vMobile Delta engine of, uh, of Redbend or, or others. So what do we do? We, we, we develop a lightweight M2M client engine, which is uh, being deployed into the module. The first, first generation we'll see is with uh, ME910 and so forth, and uh, then we can expect over the course of time these kind of advantages are going to leak over to some of the other devices. And it's also standards-based, so it, it should be working with a, a standard lightweight M2M server um, from any providers, so there's interoperability there. In the portal, you can imagine this has been realized very nicely. Uh, once you create a thing, you can basically go to a tab and access the lightweight M2M objects, and you can view those in real time. So the status of different uh, variables, uh, serial number, all of this can be available. You can read and write and execute uh, each one of those things. There is also a firmware tab um, and an API, of course, which you can use. Uh, along with photo settings, and they are created within the thing definition. So you're able to set up the uh, over-the-air options during the setup. And if you go to this firmware tab um, in the management portal, you'll be able to see the lightweight M2M OTA, and you can directly update or run a campaign from, from the server there to push uh, firmware down to the device. So in this case, yes, the device management is, uh, is fully embedded into the IoT portal itself, making it very easy. Um, so this kind of takes us fully towards this direction now where device management has been very much formalized, standardized, and the customer now has uh, really ha all the API and controls in order to interact with this and very easily to integrate this with his back-end system. So he can have really, you know, a tightly a tightly integrated system where within his system he can select particular devices, uh, see both diagnostic information um, and also affect the device should he need to. Okay, so this, uh, this closes up the cellular uh, cellular over the air upgrades, there's a lot of different methods available there and it's a case of uh, choosing the right one for the customer on for a particular project. Um, but it's best to be aware of these and uh, where the future is going and if you can, if you visit customers, please do, please do uh, entice them to um, have their systems ready for photo ability. As I mentioned, some, in some cases it can be to resolve an issue, in some cases it can be because there are network changes, particularly important when we talk about category M1 and MBIOT where um, we could easily expect changes and uh, evolution of the network within the next few years. Very important. Okay, so let's, uh, let's flash over uh, what does firmware over the air mean to Bluetooth modules. Um, and we'll, we'll have a look at the Blue Mod S. How can it be done? Uh, similar diagram to what we had in the cellular. Um, 
Uh, in the top side, we have the host processor. He's connected to the, the Bluetooth module and he's using it as, a, let's say, a ser serial device uh, with the UART. Um, again, you can download the entire binary by some method if you if you have it open into the host MCU. And then if you implement the serial update protocol, you would be able to push this firmware into the Bluetooth receiver. And there's nothing particularly over the air in this sense because the, the binary is arriving from an unknown path. Yeah, if you have a router or a gateway or something, perhaps you have a path here. But otherwise, this is not really, well, it's kind of over the air because somehow it's got there, but it's not really over the air because for the Bluetooth module itself, you know, we can only really consider it over the air when the firmware is coming over the Bluetooth antenna. Um, so the lower uh, example is showing exactly that scenario. The Bluetooth module, BlueMod, it can accept uh, firmware from its Bluetooth connection from another device. So if you have a handset, a tablet, or a laptop which is able to connect uh, to the Bluetooth, uh, it will connect to the BlueMod, and then you're able to open up an application and basically upgrade the firmware in that way. In this case, what's happening, of course, is the, the upgrade is happening in between the Bluetooth module and the device. The host MCU is maybe having some information about this process, but otherwise the process is being run directly by the Bluetooth module and the, uh, the external mobile phone. So the host is completely offloaded any uh, need for storing the binary file or pushing the binary file directly. Okay, so there's different firmwares available in the download zone. So you, this, you, you are able to test this, so you can go and look for BlueMod Plus S firmware. Um, there's a few variants in there, and you've got to pay attention to which, devi uh, which device variant you're going to run in there. You can have the peripheral, the GAT client, or the all-in-one. And you should be able to um, upgrade between one version and the other in order to test, okay? So you basically log in, uh, this firmware is on the download zone, um, and you'll be able to find that. You can see you've got the BlueMod S uh, ADC firmware version 2.1 over the air update. So you can see there's different images there for a serial update or for a OTA update. So clearly you will collect the OTA update version, download that and store it locally on your hard drive. You would then open up your serial terminal, let's say locally if we're testing. Uh, if it's a remote device, um, yeah, the host MCU is probably monitoring this. But for us uh, managing the test, we can open up the serial terminal, talk to the Bluetooth module, run these commands, ATI-99, and uh, see which version of firmware is currently running on the device. Just a serial AT command. Now, once you connect um, on Android, so from your handset or your tablet, you would connect on Android um, down to the, uh, the Bluetooth module itself and open up the uh, NRF toolbox, so Nordic RF's toolbox facility available. Uh, once you open this up, you've bonded to um, the Bluetooth receiver on the other side. You can enter into the, the DFU uh, firmware upgrade part of this application. Um, yeah, so this will run the device firmware update, the DFU. Um, you can go in there and basically select the file. Um, within the file selection, um, you need to select the binary that you've downloaded on your hard drive. You also need to select the file type. So by default, we're shipping uh, the zip files. So you can select the distribution packet zip type. You need to select the scope also for the update. So uh, the usual that you'll download, let's say, as in this example, will be a, a full system package. So all rather than splitting up. So this will update the system and the application itself. And then basically you would uh, you would click the OK and off it goes. It's going to start managing the update. So at this point, yeah, we've we've uh, defined the update. You can see on the left side we've bonded to the BMS uh, plus S. So this is the BlueMod plus S DFU uh, connection. So that's the Bluetooth connection made. Uh, you then hit go, and the upload is progressing. 
And finally, once this is done, you're able to verify that the update has happened by going to your serial terminal, reopening the package, uh, uh, setting up ATI 99, sending this command to check the firmware version, and we see the firmware version's upgraded. So in this case, uh, you know, the NRF tool provides this example if the customer wants to build their own application to, to push the firmware over this Bluetooth connection via Android or via Apple, this can be managed as well. So in this way, um, let's say an installer or someone physically close to the device will be able to, over the Bluetooth connection, upgrade, upgrade the device firmware. So that's, that's in what sense we have uh, over the air upgrading for a Bluetooth module. Of course, if that Bluetooth module is part of a bigger system where there's other connections, very much as we mentioned earlier, this uh, update file can arrive via a different path and then also be pushed into the module, which then wouldn't involve the, the Bluetooth link. Okay, um, similarly for the uh, gain span based uh, Wi Fi devices, uh, over the years also possible. So, OTA firmware upgrade methods. There's uh, a couple of methods which we can demonstrate very easily uh, using the dev kit. Uh, we call these the Otafu push and pull. And uh, clearly these can be allowed to push module into the firmware or have the device pull firmware over HTTP or T HTTPS. Um, there's also a secured method of doing this, which is using the di digital signature verification, DSV, uh, in order to, to authenticate these updates and uh, before they proceed. And that's applicable to both the push and the pull methods. So if you want to test this uh, and see how this works, what, what are you going to need? You're going to need a module with a working firmware, which is already supporting OTAFU. So bear in mind that the, the Wi-Fi modules were normally supplied without firmware loaded. So if there's no firmware loaded or running, don't expect to be able to over the air upgrade it. It needs to be running some code. So the first thing we'll do is apply somewhere uh, some, file, um, some firmware into the device, and then we'll also generate a second firmware, which we'll be able to update to the module over the air. Okay. Okay, so the first step would be to build the firmware packages that we'll need for this. Um, so you can log in uh, to our Wi-Fi site wifi.telic.com, go to the SDK Builder tab and select uh, the kind of options that we need. You can, there's a, there's a user guide that can go along with this where you can check it in more detail. But essentially, you set up the build options uh, on this device in order to build the firmware uh, with something we call the EVK package because we're running on the EVK. Um, the build configuration is submitted into GainSpan. Of course, we do the, the firmware building and then we send you a message back letting you know that the firmware file, the application package is ready. So you're not doing the compilation, we're doing the compilation and you're getting the end result. Once it's ready, you'll download and zip the package and uh, basically you've got the, the firmware binary there. So you've done this once and this is your starting firmware. And basically the idea is to run the same process again, generate a new firmware and have this as your target firmware. So we now have two firmware images we can work with uh, on the Wi-Fi. So let's put the first uh, first image, the primary image, onto the gain span module. So you would basically plug in the mini USB cable. Um, we must remember that there's also a program and run switch which needs to be set in the correct jump, uh, jumper direction. So we need to short the jumper J13 and then perform the power cycle. And this will put it into to flash mode or program mode. So now we're going to flash uh, the module using the flash programmer. So there's a tool that was delivered actually as part of the, the firmware download, um, which will be the actual flash programmer. So you'd want to launch the serial flash programmer, select the UART involved and the port assignment, and the default port assignment should be at uh, nearly one megaboard. Um, there is a jumper, by the way, you can change on the eval board to allow it to work at 115200 in case you have some hardware limitation. 
Um, check connection, after the check connection is good, we set up a couple of options to set up a super block file and the current firmware version file. And then eventually we hit a Raisin program, uh, which runs the actual update process. Once this is done, we can uh, turn off the device, change the run mode jumper back on, and uh, we're ready to repower up the board. So at this point, our um, Wi-Fi device is containing a working firmware. That's what we've achieved with this. So we've downloaded and created some firmware, and using a local connection, we've, uh, we've uh, pushed this onto the module itself. So now we have a running firmware, we can demonstrate how this can be upgraded. Um, so we need to make sure we're in run mode and uh, restart the device. Now this is serial Wi-Fi firmware, so what happens is when the device starts up on your territory, then what you should have is uh, a welcome banner with some information and some serial logs. This is the actual application inside the Wi-Fi module starting up. You're now able to check the version um, in order to see which version you're currently running. And then further to this, what we're going to do is actually set up a, a Wi-Fi limited access point. Now, these devices can actually operate where, you know, they have a kind of hybrid mode. So they can offer a Wi-Fi access point at the same time they're acting as a client. So this can be maintained as an admin connection. Okay, so these are a set of AT commands down here. These are basically setting up the security, uh, the IP address, uh, you can see the name of the access point being set up there, again, span lap and the channel. Um, we're also enabling DHCP server and providing a user and username and password. So this is basically setting up a limited access point Wi-Fi uh, connection. And this is what we will connect to in the next section. So having done that, the Wi-Fi is up and running, and there should be a connection raised. Uh, and up here in the top, you can see the GainSpan lap connection. Um, so the next job will be to basically get your laptop or your tablet and uh, and have this connect to that Wi-Fi connection. There's going to be some security involved in this, and depending on how you've set this up with your admin password in the in the last um, section when you created the link, you'll be able to connect and log on via this. And once you're connected in, um, you can go to this uh, URL on the device. So we had the static IP set up on the device in the previous page. And you basically go to otafu.html on the device. So there's a web interface running. You can click on Browse for the firmware file, select your firmware file, and click Go. And, uh, and that's it. It's going to send the firmware over the air. Uh, over the Wi-Fi connection to the device, the client on the device uh, is going to collect this from the HTTP server, the web server, and engage the internal methods to upgrade the firmware. Once the process is done, you'll see a success message, as you can see reported up here on the web page itself, um, and also a message is sent down to the, the, the TerraTerm or the host MCU. So if your processor is connected and we've just undergone a firmware upgrade, your host MCU is going to be kept updated. We can then go ahead, of course, and check um, version and see that we are, in fact, running a new version of firmware. And, uh, and that's it. We will have upgraded the, the firmware on the Wi-Fi module. So pretty pretty simple and straightforward. Um, so these really are the methods for um, yeah, cellular, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi in order to, to push new firmware down onto the device. Okay, let's, let's close my presentation. Thank you, Vikas. Uh, we have some questions, actually. Is it possible, or do you support ability to roll back firmware if it is that work okay? Uh, roll back firmware. Um, there's there's a couple of places where let's say you could anticipate failure. Um, there could be there could be issues in uh, retrieving the file itself, and perhaps uh, there's been some errors in the transmission. This this kind of thing would be picked up by the the Delta unpacking engine, and if there's any issue at this point, the new Delta is not deployed, so it will automatically use the older version. However, I did have a similar question actually um, a week ago from another customer. 
And in that case, they were looking at the AT photo method, i.e., um, the, the main question was if if we have if we have an issue in the firmware, let's say we deploy a new firmware, we send a new Delta file, a new firmware starts running, and for some reason it's not communicating. Okay. Let's say we you know we spend a lot of time not communicating. Um, is it possible to roll back? Can the host application roll back to the old firmware? And this 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 one's not possible in in the standard method. However, however, if if you're downloading the Delta files into your host, what you can actually do is download the Delta for the forward upgrade and also the Delta for the reverse upgrade. So in this in this way, your host could hold two Delta files, one for the forward path upgrade and one for the reverse path. And should you decide for some reason the host decides that it's not working very well, it in theory would be able to reverse upgrade. However, we de definitely recommend that you know this uh, before you upgrade anything, you soak test heavily uh, on the bench with any new firmware version, and you know completely satisfy yourselves that there shouldn't be such an issue. And if it makes you feel better to be able to roll back, yes, there's a way to do it at least. Okay. Um, yeah, that's probably okay. the best I can answer. <laughs> okay, uh, we have another one. What's the longest time the TOTA update can take? Oh, the longest time. Um, okay, yeah, it's an important point. I mean, uh, the Delta firmware upgrade, we haven't said a lot about the time involved. So clearly, it's, uh, it's a, not a full binary we're downloading and just saving. There's actually a Delta file, and then there's going to be some process involved in in unpacking this Delta file onto the system. Um, in some cases, yeah, we could be looking at eight, eight to ten minutes, but clearly this is going to be a function also of you know how much Delta change there is. And in the worst case, let's say we have um, a huge number of changes, so. What happens is uh, within the chipset providers, you know, at some periods in time, they may deliver to us some uh, larger updates. Um, in this case, the deltas become also large, and perhaps there's deltas in the thousands. So in this case, we have larger deltas. Um, in the worst case, yeah, you could end up needing to use, uh, let's say, two deltas because you have a very old firmware and you want to upgrade to the latest. So in fact, you may need to engage two Delta files to run through this, and let's say each 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 process may take 10 minutes. So yeah, it's certainly uh, an amount of time. So <laughs> slightly slightly undefined, and of course it depends on the network conditions and the size of the Delta and uh, which device it's running on exactly. But yeah, you should be able to cater for uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes at an absolute worst case if you have very old firmware. Okay. Yeah, and uh, one more because for high-speed devices like LM940, what photo option are supported there, especially for North American market like uh, Verizon operator? Ah, okay, Verizon operator. Well, it's, if it's going to be Verizon approved, then it's uh, it's going to have to support the lightweight M2M uh, device management um, system anyway. So all of the latest Verizon firmware is uh, supporting, uh, well Verizon basically mandate that we need to use lightweight M2M and have these features built in so the network is also able to uh, manage via lightweight M2M uh, firmware and device management. So yeah, I'd say lightweight M2M. Okay. Um, yeah, consider though the the files for such such modems are considerably <laughs> large, but but also the data pipe is large, so maybe you know. In essence, it can take uh, the same time. Okay, uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure being with you today, and uh, see you in two weeks with uh, another TELIT uh, webinar based on mobile broadband on November 14. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Vikas. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Bye bye. bye.